Hello and welcome to the Kaz and Daz show on Focus Hoops. I nearly said the Focus Hoops podcast. It's been a long week. Uh, my name is Darren Paul. I'm going to be joined by Kaz Bullock in just a moment. British basketball, Manchester basketball royalty herself. And as you can see on the screen, we've got Ipswich coach Rob Shatton coming to talk all things WNBL, maybe a bit of NBL as well. Of course, we've got WNBL Roundup, WBBL Roundup, Kaz's Corner. Kaz is going to take us all over the world again in another t- hot week in Australia, but a tough one for a uh, friend of Focus Hoops, Brit Smarts, UC Capitals. We're going to get to all of that in just a moment, but let's bring in Rob Shatton and Kaz Bullock. Kaz, how are you doing today? I'm good. I'm good. It's um, it's concerning that since we spoke to Brit, UC Capitals have no. gone on. Bit of a, a no. <laughs> why would you why would you ever say that don't bring that negativity into this sacred Nothing. circle okay because now we've got an ipswich guy on and <laughs> we don't know no anyway rob how are you i i was good i'm less good now for hearing that slightly worried i'm going to be out of favor now but i'm, this- I'm sure all will be fine just keep this away from nick drain and everything's going to be fine there um but no genuinely um it's a pleasure to have you on we had a we had a very nice uh conversation a few weeks ago about how i'm not a hipster so that was really good <laughs> <laughs> and uh and yeah so you've well let's just let's just talk about your role with ipswich i think let's just dive in there so what do you do well it's changed a bit this year so i've been uh this is my sixth year in the basketball club now um i've had a couple of years as an under 18s assistant coach um, I have had three seasons now with the um, senior men and due partly to a lack of uh, senior men action for us in NBL Division 2 this season, uh, I'm now getting my second chance to be an assistant for the senior women's team. Um, so, obviously, horrible circumstances, we know that, but it has given you opportunity to work in uh, WNBL D1. How have you found it? How have you found the difference? from working with the men's program to the women's elite program? Uh, it's, it's great to be working with Nick again. It's been uh, three years and a bit since I was working with Nick the last time, but obviously we've been around the club together for um, six or seven now. Nick's the guy that, that took me through my level two course in the first place. So i uh, kind of known him ever since I started this high level coaching. And um, it's really great to be around not just his expertise again, but also be around such an incredible group of players as well. Um, this is obviously a, a pretty special season um, mm-hmm. for these girls. You've seen a lot of them making their commitment statements in the last couple of weeks. So we know that there's going to be a few leaving at the end of this season. And it's it's um, a really exciting season to see what we can achieve before they all head off to pastures new. Let's talk about, let's talk about this season. Um, <clears throat> just, diving into it like how important is it to win as much as you can if not everything this year well we've had this group of players together for three years it's been kind of largely unchanged for three years and this is obviously the 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 sort of culmination of that like i said you know we already know esther cameron and and ella um are off to to the the states to play college basketball next season um so it's um obviously our last opportunity to really put our stamp on division one, I guess. I know that, uh, you know, obviously the team won it last year, but not really in the circumstances that we would have wanted, um, obviously. Um, And it's a great opportunity to do that um, the right way, if you like, the complete way this time around. What's been the biggest challenge so far for you guys this season? Um, I think playing our first five games on the road has been been kind of tough, to be honest. Um, you know, we had a, a situation at the start of the season where um, our home court hasn't been available to start the year. Um, the school um, was obviously taking some restrictive measures with, with COVID and um, we haven't had an opportunity to play at home. We haven't really had an opportunity properly to train at home for about a six week period across the start of the season. So that's been that's been a pretty, pretty major challenge is trying to. Um, to figure out sort of road games every week, where are we going? You know, this week, who, 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 who's changing room can we use this week? Um, that's been fun, uh, but we've come through it with a with a five zero record, um, which is fantastic. And the girls have, have really gutted out some some big wins in that in that stretch as well. Whose responsibility is it to 
to do all the logistics and the legwork for for all of that. Is that fall on your shoulders? We've got a team manager, Rich <laughs> Lidemore, um, new to the team this season. Um, so he and our apprentice coach, Ollie Mile, do a lot of the, the logistics around sort of, you know, you have to do COVID um, screening now. Before you get on the bus, you have to take all of that stuff with you. Uh, when you get to the arena, you've got to do it all again for whoever the away team is. Um, so all of that has been an extra burden on on sort of team management this year. But yeah, we're in the fortunate situation that we've had a dedicated team manager for a long time. Um, Nick worked with a, a wonderful guy called Terry Rigby for a very long time. Um, Terry's taken a step back this year and Rich, is, uh, Rich has stepped up into that role. So we're very fortunate to have someone who who takes care of all of that stuff for us and Rich is looking at the scheduling and trying to get our, our season mapped out for us at the same time. How has it how has it been playing so many away games without the you know people in attendance? Has it has that made much of a difference, or have you guys just been able to realize that we're just going to play sort of despite the travel aspect of it? Yeah, it, it's weird at times um, playing with with no one in the gym. Uh, playing on the road every week is is we've kind of looked at the positives of it, uh, which are the the way that this league is is panning out this year. There's a lot of competitive teams, and you expect the the challenge to go right up to the last week or so of the season. So it's great to have got, um, you know, three or four really tough away games out of the way early on. Uh, it's nice to have a lot of home games in in, in the pocket for later on in the season. Um, uh, obviously, in terms of having no fans in the arenas, it's, it's probably not so much of a deal when you're on the road. Um, it was amazing to be able to have some fans in with us for our, our home game at the weekend. That was uh, really special. Which of the games that you've played so far? You obviously you know, they have been quite quite tough four games. Which is the one you've been mm -hmm. pleased with that you've come out of it with with a win? Uh, oh, that's a good question. Um, I think there's been a couple to be honest. Like the um, the Solent game away, um, second game of the season. So we had a, a solid win over Barking Abbey to to start the year, um, and then in that Solent game we were up big twice in the game um i think in the first quarter and then again in the third quarter and um we kind of couldn't put them away they're, they're a really strong side and we saw a lot of um character from them again this weekend um so they just they just kept coming back and tied the game or uh, brought the game within a, a, a possession i think late on um and we had the the sort of mental wherewithal to see that out and i think in such a young group where we've got an average age of less than 20 years old is you know that's that's really impressive and it's something i've said to them since i've i've joined um the group that the the kind of mental toughness that the girls show in tough situations in in late game is uh, is really impressive especially after two or three years of being around um senior teams you know it's it's, it's really special in terms of solon um now to me every time i see them they seem like this really defensive gritty tough to score against the team. I mean, seeing how Anglia Ruskin have done against them the last couple of seasons, it's always low score and it's always, you know, quite tense. And then you guys play this, you know, just run and gun Euro game against them. I thought LeVar Ball was coaching on the sideline for one of you two teams <laughs> this weekend. Like, talk to me about that. Like, did you get them out of their comfort zone or is that is that common for a game between between you guys for, for the form in terms of how they play, again, the dogged, defensive, just stop, 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 to just everybody's trying to score hundreds. It's great. But yeah, um, yeah I think the the pace of play for us is, is like you say, the t for the two teams, it's significantly different. Um, I think we're averaging probably 10, 15 possessions more a game than Solent are. Um, but I think on uh, Sunday, we kind of had a combination of taking each other out of our comfort zones. I think they... Um, uh, you know, particularly in the second half, they they beat us up for a lot of effect, offensive rebounds, um, and they uh, you know they got a lot of second chance points. Um, we had quite a lot of run out um, fast breaks in the first half, so I think it it was all just um, perhaps when when you're playing against such a fast team as as we are, you you, you respond naturally to increase your own pace of play. But um, yeah, it's two very very tight games. We've been um, fortunate enough to win both of them by the same margin by eight points but um two really competitive fixtures and two quite different games as well if you look at how the game went 
at their place, I think we we probably played a bit more um, to their pace, particularly in the in the first half. Whereas this time, the first half we really dominated the pace, and then the second half they, uh, to be fair, they kind of went, okay, we can we can play at that <laughs> that speed as well, and um, brought it back again, brought it back to within a, a possession at one point. Um, the game that really stood out to me that you guys played this season was the Worcester game, because mm. well, first off, you've got Coco Lung back, so. Just, just what the rest of the WNBL needed was just like this absolute <laughs> superstar uh, guard coming back in. So that's that's really great to see Coco back in the league. But um, yeah, it was looking like it was going to be oh, it's a bit spicy. Worcester had it going early doors, and then you lot just did what you lot do and really took the game to them and and then away from them, and you really throttled it after about midway through the second quarter into the second half. Just talk us through that game. Yeah, it, uh, it's great having Coco back. Um, it's nice to, you know, be able to put her on the floor again after um, she obviously has had to travel here and, and um, self isolate as well. So um, I know she was really looking forward to it, and it, it's um, it's great to have another uh, another relative veteran that we can plug in. Um, it was an interesting game. I think it was kind of similar to what I said about Solent and us this weekend. We kind of. Um, found a balance of, of playing um, through their defense, I think, in the second half. And um, to be fair, we had a we had a really poor shooting performance and they made four of their first six threes. So they started out really hot. We started out very, very cold. Um, I think from memory, I think we stayed quite cold from three the whole game, but um, managed to find a way of getting points consistently in transition instead. Um, I think that's that's one of the impressive things about this team is that we've got different ways of, of scoring. So, yes, we've got three or four potent three-point shooters, but if that's not falling, then we've got other things we can go to as well. How have you found it um, coaching, of course, Harriet Wellham this year? Let's just talk about your one of your one of your stars, one of the many. Yes, yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, Has has obviously been at Ipswich for a very long time, and. Uh, you know, she um, she puts her heart and soul on the court for us every time she she gets out there in an Ipswich jersey. And uh, I remember remarking to to Ollie uh, in the second quarter, uh, one of our other assistant coaches, um, in the game. Um, Ollie, Marl, and I have got a stats pad each, and we're doing I'm doing stats for the other team. He's doing them for our team. Um, and every time I was recording what had happened down at the other end of the court, I would look up and Harriet was running in a layup in the second quarter, and um, that's you know when she when she gets on uh, on a scoring run there's there's not very many ways of stopping her um but i think she has a you know her and nick have a really special relationship and it it filters down through the whole team now <clears throat> i love the wnbl love wnbl harriet wellham wbbl i'm just gonna just gonna say those words and see how how that falls well uh I don't think you're the first ones to say them this season or last season. Um, Harriet's been on the the BE website, uh, the BE podcast, and, and other podcasts recently, saying that you know in this country she only wants to play for Nick, only wants to play for Ipswich. Um, she's working with our academy. Um, she's playing at a very high level. I mean, to 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 say Harriet Wellham WBBL, you've got to have the argument WBBL versus WNBL, and you know what the change in level is and. Um, she's in a really good team in a really competitive league. You know, mm. I know, I know we've got a perfect record. I know we're six and zero, but if you look at the results, we've we've had two very tight games against Solent. We've had uh, a very tight game against Worcester. Um, we've had an overtime game with Cola. You know, we haven't played Reading yet. Haven't played Loughborough yet. Bristol. So there's so much talent in this league. It's so deep that um, I I don't know. I'd be very cautious about suggesting that. That this is any less competitive than than the WBBL. So that, what I'm hearing there is Harriet Wellen to Europe. That's <laughs> that's, 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 what, that's what I'm taking from this. I think what you heard was Harriet Wellen in Ipswich. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, you know, I hope she's um, she's happy doing what she's doing now. And like I said, working yeah. with with Nick and being able to help develop these. Uh, these stellar group of, of academy players that we've got um, coming through. Um, 
there's another group coming through behind them um, that we're, we're just as excited about. So um, I think being able to work through the academy with, with, with these girls, get some coaching experience on the sideline as well on a Wednesday, um, and then um, getting out and getting to play with them on the weekend, I think, is uh, hopefully is a lot of fun. Yeah, that's that's sorry, Cass, but that that's what came across in our interview with Vicky Gray the other week. You know, she's somebody who has played with Harriet for GB teams, England teams, and has played in WBBL. But it yeah. seems like the most she's enjoyed her basketball has been with Trent in the WNBL, and that you know, it at some point has to be the most important thing. And I left Trent off that list as well, so I shouldn't. I shouldn't have done. I left Trent off that list of teams oh. that are going to be really good. Um, they're going to clip. This. I knew that. I knew there was one I'd forgotten. So there is. There's another one um, you forgot as well. No, I can't think of any more. Ruskin. <laughs> <laughs> I have. We haven't. We haven't uh, played Ruskin yet. So that's the only reason I left them out. Uh -huh. um, it's my first year. I don't know all the teams. Yet. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I, I, I think you're totally right. It's it's about where, um, you know, we're not talking about basketball at the fully professional level, are we? So it's, it's about where you're comfortable, where you're happy and where you're getting fulfillment as well. And if that's playing very high level, you know, Division One NBL and helping to develop a, a really strong academy program in the week, then, then that's great. Um, I, I think, to be fair, the gap between WBBL and WNBL is not just a meritocracy. Otherwise, you know, we finished top of, of the NBL last year, we'd be in the WBBL. Mm. So there's other factors that that um, uh, come into you getting into the WBBL. Um, so it's, it's not as easy a decision as I think a lot of people assume it is. Could that be something that Ipswich would look at down the road? Um, yeah, I don't think we'd, we'd rule it out. Um, yeah. But we've 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 not um, exactly sort of stamped our mark on on WNBL as we as we would like to yet. Um, you know, we like I said, we were finished top last season, um, won the title in a way. I know that the whole club and the whole team want to do that um, the the right way, if you like, this season. But um, it's got to be right for the it's got to be right for the whole club as an organisation. It can't just be about that team. You look at what Solent um, are, are the perfect example. You know their men's team is undefeated in I don't know how long now in the the WNBL, but they've or the NBL, sorry, but they've made the decision mm -hmm. not to go BBL, um, and that is because it doesn't suit the club. Um, so it, it, it's got to be a move that your your structure and your organisation can support. There's no, you know, there, there isn't a, a sort of high level indoor sports facility in Ipswich that we could play out of. Um, the majority of our players are 16 to 19. So mm -hmm. by default, they're not players that are going to stay in the club long term, you know, especially if we're developing them to the level that we want to be developing them to. Um, then they should be looking at university programs and not just for basketball, but to, to further their education as well. So um, it, I don't think we'd ever say no to it. Yeah. Um, but it, it has to be the right fit for Ipswich Basketball Club, not just Ipswich Basketball Club senior women's team. Is it time that WBBL, WNBL, in the same way that they're starting to, with the men's side, throw open and have a national competition? I think that would be great. You know, we had um, two preseason fixtures against WBBL sides. We won one and lost the other one. Um, so it would be great to see where we stack up. And that, you know, that maybe would be a a joint cup competition like like what they do on the men's side would be an opportunity for us to to demonstrate that and and hey maybe you know if if a, an AIU or an Ipswich or a Solent is very competitive in that then maybe it, it would um, tip more clubs in in the direction of thinking about joining the WBBL. Um, obviously, it's a it's a franchise system, so you're joining it, you're making quite a long term commitment, um, and I think. Uh, I'm not saying this is necessarily the trigger for us, but part of it is is wanting to know that you're going to be able to be competitive in the longer term, yeah. whether you're going to need to, you know, programs might need to make a financial commitment to be to be successful in the long term. They might need to know that they've got more of a pipeline of players coming through. I know there's quite a lot of university programs in it, but if you're an academy structure like us or like a Barking Abbey, 
you've got to know that you've got that depth of talent coming through year in, year out to be competitive. Um, because you can't ultimately you can't get to that level with a certain requirement of, of structure behind it and then just just not be in the hunt uh, year in, year out. So let's just move to um, talking about, let's talk about Esther. Sure. Again, say, same as, oh, no, sorry, I did have another question about um, Harriet. You say she's coaching, you know, midweek on the Wednesday. Is she coaching players that she's then playing with on the Saturday and the Sunday, or is she playing coaching uh, a lower age group? No, she's assisting the um, EABL and WB. Well, I don't know how much she's involved in the EABL, to be fair, but um, she assists on the WABL bench. Um, so she's coaching, well, <laughs> again, not at the moment, but in, in normal times, she'd be assisting in the week for uh, the likes of Esther, Cameron, Becky, Ella, Charlotte, <laughs> and then playing with them on the weekend. How how has that gone for her, and how does how does she feel about it? How do the other players feel about that? Obviously, I'm assuming positive, but is that quite strange in some ways? I think they all they all have a, a tremendous amount of respect for her anyway, and what she's achieved. And um, you know, I don't think there's ever any doubt about her basketball knowledge. Um, mm -hmm. When you talk to her about the game, uh, when you talk to her about what's, what she's seeing out on the court or, or what's going on around her. You know, there's no doubting that, that she knows enough to to be a coach. So, um, and there's <laughs> there's no doubting if you look at the box score that she knows enough to be a player. So, um, <laughs> I don't think it's I, I've never seen it cause any problems. It's not the first time we've had that situation. To be fair, we used to have um, when Tom Sadler was was coaching our men's uh, EABL side, and then some of those players were appearing for our Division Two men's team on the weekend. So it's. Uh, it's all part of our IBC family nature structure that everything is uh, based around run, one club rather than a lot of teams. So, right. Talking about the um, the academy and the structure that you've got there, can you just yeah. talk about how important that is for a club? Because to, to help the players grow and to you know have that opportunity to move on to the next teams. Well, it means it means we have access to Nick uh, apart from anything else. Um, you know, obviously the, the academy is is, uh, is Nick's full time job, and the, the club and the academy are, are very closely intertwined. So that's that's one huge benefit. But it, yeah, it's why our senior teams have been successful. Um, you know, going back for the last um, four, five, six years on the on the women's side and, and longer on the men's side, we've had a a very strong pipeline of of um, Suffolk born and bred talent coming through. Um, pretty consistently that's that's made appearances in our in our senior programs all the way back to um you know the first Ipswich National League team that we, we put in about nine or ten years ago had uh, the likes of, sort of Jake Ine and it Joel Keeble who um were in the academy at that time um and all the way through from sort of Sam Newman's Luke Maskell Wrights Caleb Fuller uh, Ashley Pink Maya Price Harriet Danny Casey um and last season, obviously, Ethan, um, we had Luke and Jake back last year uh, on the men's side. So all the way along, that, that academy has been the, the platform for us to have senior teams. And it's, it's why the two are, are so important to one another, I think. Um, but it also gives all of the kids in our, in our um, junior program something to aspire to. When you're showing every single season that there are players coming through your academy and making up the majority of the senior team year in, year out, you know, that's a... a a very strong attainable picture for for the kids that are in our junior program to say okay i can do that um when you watch our games on a normal weekend and this is why it's so sad that we can't have um i was gonna say can't have fans we did have fans can't have a full um 150 200 people in coppleston yet um you'll always see you know kids from from right across our junior program watching every women's game and every men's game and uh, in any in any one of those crowds, there are players that might be in that team in five years' time. That's great. I'm talking about you know the the player pipeline, and obviously after players leave you, you've got how many commits did you say to America this year? Three already. Uh, four. Ethan uh, has committed as well, so Ethan is going to Eastern Washington University, um, and then Esther Cameron and uh, Ella on the girls' side. So how is just what is your feelings regarding that? You know, how do you feel when you see these players commit to these American schools and then obviously 
out the door they go. Um, it uh, it's really rewarding. Um, we <laughs> we had a, a player um, come through the door a long time ago when I was in the under eight, under eighteens program, and so I heard you send players to the states, and I really want to go. And um, he was extremely talented at the time, but very raw. And he he joined the program for two years, and he got a scholarship, and he's been out there for uh, for three years. Um, but you know, I, I can't take much credit for um, Estherella and Cameron. Um, can't take too much credit for any of them because I'm a volunteer coach on the weekends, and all the hard work is done at the academy. But um, you know, when you get to see, obviously, it's the dream for a lot of these kids, and it's the um, the opportunity of a lifetime to go and, and live in. Uh, Washington or Florida or, uh, you know, we've had kids go to Texas, Massachusetts. Um, it's an incredible experience. It's, you know, if you if you could have told me at 19 that I could have had that chance, then I, I would have wanted to go. So it's very fulfilling being able to to be part of that, even if, like I say, I'm a very small part of that. But um, it, it really gives you something to focus on when you're working on, on junior development, when you're working on... Um, things through the summer or trying to put a senior team together so that, that some of these kids can get more exposure. Um, it's, it's great to have that as a, as a second goal aside from any kind of team performance. Have you sent any, and forgive, forgive my ignorance here, but have you sent any players to Europe directly as opposed to the States? Uh, we've had players. Uh, you're really testing my, <laughs> my historical knowledge of the program now and I'm not going to look what great we do. I'm about having been here for ages <laughs> um, I don't know if we did before my time I can't think of any in my six or seven years that have gone directly to Europe we've had several who've um, done college then played in Europe so um, Luke and, and Jake come to mind they both played in Italy I think um, Jake possibly in Spain as well Um I can't think of one that's gone directly to Europe yet, but yeah. I mean, um, that, I mean, we have to wait and see, sadly, that might become a bit more of a challenge now after the 1st of January. Um, I keep forgetting. I keep putting it out of my mind. I, it's better to do that, but, um, I saw something today. I don't know if it's definite, but I saw something today saying that we won't be involved in Erasmus anymore. Mm. Um, so if we're not involved in that kind of program, I'm guessing that it's going to be harder for our kids to get visas to do, um, you know, for, for college places in mainland Europe as well, which is incredibly sad because the language barrier aside, I think if you look at the developmental opportunities in in Spain, in France, in Italy, um, in Greece, you know, there are some incredible club structures yeah. uh, all the way across Europe and there is some incredible high-level basketball to be played out there. Um, I think you've only got to look at, at the success that Kareem has had, that Carl Wheatle's had you know being developed through the european systems rather than rather than going to college and it should be viewed as a legitimate alternative mm -hmm. I, I, the language barrier would be really daunting i think um we did have one uh now that you mentioned it uh veron as a uh, when he was in the ipswich program uh, about four years ago he moved from ipswich to stella azura um in italy uh was there for a season and then came home um he's the only example i can think of of sending players directly to europe i think the language barrier is a big deal mm. uh for kids that are 15 16 years old but if you have the uh the confidence and the, and the willing to go and learn then it, it's perfectly attainable and you know that's the best age to learn a language anyway aside from anything yeah else. yeah i mean it's like you see it with reading like the amount of spanish players for example that they've brought through and young spanish players like i'm thinking like Noah and uh, Elena, who are now at Anglia Ruskin, but mm. he came over here at 15, must have been 16, to do their college experience. There. Is that ever anything that, and again, now we're talking in this post meltdown world, if you don't like that, I apologize, but that's where we're at. Um, where everything's a bit out of the window. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I was going to say, is that something that you'd ever think about, you know, like dipping into the European market? Um, it's not doable anymore, you know. 
Well, yeah, we'll have to wait and see. I think Reading have got really strong connections in, in Spanish basketball, haven't they? They've had a succession of Spanish coaches. Um, yeah. That that kind of, I, I don't think you can start from scratch. I think you'd have to start with connections with coaches at a program in, in a country that's looking to develop opportunities for their kids to come to the UK. Um, the we've had one or two instances of, of um, senior players coming over from, from Europe to play for Ipswich. Um, we had Eddie Ferreira and Danny Caluco come over to play for the men's team um, f- uh, four or five years ago. Um, that's the only time of, I can think that, that it's happened. And I think, you know, like I said, I think you, you've got to have a very uh, well-developed connection. Um because that's going to take a lot of trust on both sides. It's going to take a lot of trust for a player to move to the UK, and it's going to take a lot of trust for us to to put an academy spot on a player that, that that's coming across and, again, has to deal with that cultural barriers, language barriers of, of adapting to a new country. Um, obviously, it's something that you know we wouldn't say no to. Um, mm. And if there are players overseas who want to look at IBA, then um, give Coach Train a call. <laughs> um, but... Uh, yeah, I don't think it's it's something that we've ever sort of explored extensively. In terms of your own coaching development, like what have you wanted to get out of this season? Uh, I'm trying to uh, get a bit more involved in advanced scouting this year. Um, I've been, uh, when I first joined the, the senior programs, I was a, a stats coach on the bench um, and mainly looked at uh, statistical analysis and sort of X's and O's. Um, I've tried over the last couple of years to, to get a bit more involved in in practice coaching. Uh, I don't think it's necessarily my strength, but it's it's something that I really want to develop. Um, I've had you know this is my seventh year as a as an assistant coach, and it's a role I really enjoy. But it's just trying to find, it, especially when you work with a new coach, it's trying to find the things that you can do to be useful and the things that you can do to contribute, and that is different. It's different for every coach and it's different within every every program as well. So every program will have a different set of skills in their head coach or their other assistant coach or, or whoever. Um, and every every head coach I've worked with has, has wanted something slightly different out of me as well. So, um, yeah, really just trying to find the, the point where the skills you have can be useful to the head coach um, and to the team. I think that's the, the key thing. Do you... Do you ever challenge your head coaches and their ideas? And is that something that's encouraged at Ipswich? Uh, yeah, I yeah. So the first year that I was um, in the the senior programs was with Nick, and we had two assistants. Um, so I think it, it wasn't my role so much then. But I think ever since then, you know, I've I've gone from um, sort of second assistant to lead assistant with with John Ellis, um, Adam Robinson last year, and and now obviously I'm back working with with Nick and Josh Carson um, in the women's side. Um, everyone's opinion has has always been welcome. Um, I think we we are doing a very good job early in this season of communicating as a staff. When there's four of you and you've got a minute for a timeout, it can be difficult to get key things across. Mm-hmm. Um, but we have quite a good uh, relationship on the bench. I've known Josh for a, a long time anyway. I've known Nick, like I said, for a long time. Um, I've known Ollie for a couple of years around the club. So we've we've found our stride as a coaching staff, but it's not like anyone has been new to me particularly. So um, that's another thing that I think as an assistant, you have, to, you have to become accustomed to early in a season and figure out how you're going to do that, how you're going to communicate up and down a bench. Mm. Um, because there is a time and a place for discussion and exchanging ideas. And it's about five seconds at the start of a timeout while players are walking to a bench. So um, it's one thing that I was terrible at when I first started coaching was being prepared for that timeout instance. Um, but as I've gone along, I guess, and become more experienced, it's it's um, become a bit more natural to have the ideas in your head as as the game goes along and then you're ready when, when the timeout comes to, to contribute. Are you one of these coaches that sat there, you know, you're on the bench watching a game and are you like seeing what plays they're obviously you're seeing what plays they're running, but as in like, you're like, oh, they're doing this. Oh, they're going to this, the zipper or, or whatever. And you're just sort of like making notes of that. Like what, what, what is, what's your role? Like you say you're doing stats. Do you do anything other than that? Uh, trends, maybe trends more than specific offenses. If I'm, um, 
the big problem with being a stats coach on the bench is you don't see the whole game. Mm -hmm. You probably see maybe 25 minutes of the game. Um, okay. And the rest of the time, you know, until you know the program well enough that you can sit there with the tablet and, and be recording it without looking at the tablet, which, um, you know, I'm 30 now. I'm probably getting a bit old for that, um, <laughs> that, that fleet of thought. But um, I am, during a game, specifically looking for our, our KPIs. I, I would imagine every head coach at this level has got key things that they, they need to be aware of during a game. So for us, it's things like making sure that we control our turnovers, obviously playing at a high pace, you're going to turn the ball over more, but we want to really focus on controlling it. Uh, offensive rebounding has been a key for us. Um, things like um, I'll look at other uh, individual players' shooting tendencies. Um, so we played Christina Velke on Sunday. Obviously, she she likes to shoot the ball from mid-range. She was devastating from mid-range on Sunday. Um, I think, I can't remember if she ended up with 19 or 21, but she had 15 through three quarters. Mm. Uh, and 12 of them were mid-range jump shots. So um, you have to, you know, what I think what I've developed over the last few years is taking it from saying, hey, she's making a lot of jump shots to being able to make a suggestion to, to make an adjustment or, you know, it might be that she's making, uh, a player's making a lot of mid-range jump shots, but not a high percentage. Um, and you have to weigh the decision. Do you live with it? Um, statistically, it's a, not an invoke shot in the game right now. So, um, if you're, you might, you might want to let the national league know because <laughs> in national league, we love, we love the mid range. Oh, I love a mid range jump shot. I, I, hey, I like, um, my, my basketball interest comes from sort of early 2000s San Antonio Spurs and watching the ball go into Tim Duncan and David Robinson, every possession and, and cutting and mid range jump shots off of that. And then. Manu Ginobili coming in and, and changing the game a bit. But, um, yeah, no, I, I, I've got a, a very strong appreciation for a good <laughs> solid jump shot form. Uh, been lucky enough to have one or two in, in the time I've been at Ipswich that have got phenomenal jump shot shape. Uh, and it's it's a great thing to watch. But right now, unfortunately, the, the game is all about how how do we get layups and threes because mm. they're 0.003% more likely to win us a game than, than shooting mid-range jump shots. So. Wow. I mean, no, I made that up. Yes, that's not. Okay. With, with the, <laughs> I mean, with the way you, I say, with the way you've built your roster, with the way your roster has has developed, it might be a better way of saying it. You've got layups in abundance, Harriet Wellham. I'm looking at Harriet Wellham in particular, and Esther Little, of course. And you've got three point shooting, Charlotte Redhead, for example. Like when when she's on, she is on, and yeah. Danny Casey as well. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you guys have those two areas pretty sewn up, is uh, fair to say. Yeah, I think um, Harriet is, is is tough to guard, whether she's going to the basket or or, or stopping from, from outside and shooting from there. Um, but, yeah, we've, we've been fortunate enough that we've um, uh, built a really good cast of, of shooting around um, her, I think. But um, the key thing for us this year has been the games where we've had um, Cameron and Esther being able to play um, inside and, and get scores inside, whether it's um, for Esther, it's slightly more in the cutting game. Um, Cameron's big game against Trent was was a lot of inside catches and being able to go to work in the, in the post and make one dribble moves and score. Um, but I think we've got, you know, particularly once sort of um, Becky and Ella coming off the, off the bench um, and Coco coming off the bench as well. Coco is a bit more of a mid-range shooter. Uh, we've got a really varied offense and it's, it's, I, sort of stats regardless I still feel like the best offense is variety mm. um, and you've got to be able to if a, if a team is switching defenses on you and the team goes from man to zone to man you've got to have the assets out on the court that can break down either of those defenses so you need to be able to shoot over a team or you need to be able to cut through them um, and we've got a really nice mix of offensive talent where I think we can do both of those things um, we can also get out and run really well which helps <laughs> I think that's undersold it just a little bit in terms of the get out and run game. Uh, Big Sausage came in with a question. The question is, question, how old are you, Rob? And then the answer came in, 30. No way. So, there we go. How do you draw you out, Big Sausage? I appreciate the question. I, I, have, a, I have an idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in terms of 
basketball. Why basketball? What what got you into basketball? Uh, well, I think I was I was always um, extremely interested in every sport I picked up when I was a kid, uh, and I'm not. Uh, despite a, a long uh, history of trying to be in local league, I'm not very effective in any sport I play. Uh, I wasn't bad at pool while I was at university, but that's about as good as it's ever got. Um, basketball, uh, I, I happen to show slightly more proficiency for, I think, at, at secondary school than uh, certainly than, than football or rugby, which is what we played most of the time. And um, I really like learning about sports. I'm a, a hoops trivia um, addict. I'm a sports trivia addict in general. Um, and as soon as I had some success playing basketball when I was 14, 15, I, I really um, threw myself into the NBA. Um, and it, it, yeah, it's just kind of gone from there, really. I think the, the coaching all started by quite a coincidence, really. It was a, a guy from local league um, that, that I had known for a few years and sort of rubbed shoulders with every now and then. Um, Aaron McDonald, who had a, a job coaching with Suffolk uh, in the county tournament. Uh, and he invited me along to that. And it was it happened to be the season that he was getting involved in IBC. And um, he invited me along to the, the Suffolk um, under-17s tournament. And I, I said yes to that um, before that tournament had started. He said, do you want to to come and coach National League with me next year? And I kind of thought, well, it's, um, it's the opportunity I'm going to get to be around basketball at a higher level. Because by the time I was, you know, I was 23 then, I think it had started to click. I was probably not going to get drafted anytime soon um, so it was a chance for me to go and play uh, a, a, a part in high level basketball and um, I first joined a team a club when I was 18 and when I joined Ipswich I was coaching players who were two years younger than me I'd been playing National League for four years so it was a little bit of a learning curve <laughs> um, sorry two years younger than I had been when I started um, you know 16 year olds have been playing National League since the under 13s um, so I definitely knew less about basketball than any of the players that I was coaching to start off with. But um, yeah, it's just it's it's been an incredible thing to be part of. Ipswich is is such a great environment to be part of. Um, there's always so much going on. You know, any time I've ever been at a home game, you can guarantee there's other games happening. Um, and whether it's an under fourteen girls game or an under eighteen boys game or, or whatever, there's always people there watching as well. So it's been easy to be drawn in and. Um, I can't really picture myself not doing it now. What, what do you enjoy the most about it? I think that it is access to elite level sport and it's access to being involved in elite, elite level sport. And these days it's it's something I feel like I'm making a, a positive contribution to as well. Um, it, it will probably sound corny, but it is, it is really cool to think that you can help develop um, young athletes to a point where they get to go and... Um, play at a higher level, whether that's playing regional, whether it's playing national teams, um, or whether it's going to the States as, as a few of them are, uh, um, I was going to say fortunate enough, skilled enough to do. Yeah. Um, that's really cool. That's really cool for me because teenage me would have loved that idea. Um, and um, it's, it's a motivating factor to come back every year and, and try and help develop. When I was on the men's side, there was players that I, I worked with um, during my first and second years in under 18s, who were then coming through into the men's team as I as I then switched up to, to coaching that. And there were two or three players that I coached for five or six or four or five seasons consecutively. Um, and you build really strong, you know, really strong relationships with those players, and that's part of what what keeps you coming back. This year has been the challenge of, of building some new relationships with players that I haven't worked with before. Uh, I've worked with Harriet and Danny um, the previous time I was on the the women's team, but that was um, four years ago. So the rest of them, uh, you know, I've not I've not coached before. And um, yeah, it's just it's just a, a really exciting thing to be around. I think there's a real buzz around the club all the time. In terms of women's versus men's basketball, do you have a preference? Um. I don't know. I don't know if I do. Um, I think probably last season I probably would have said men's, but mm. um, right now, you know, I'm getting 
a lot of enjoyment out of just watching our team. Um, it helps that we're really good, obviously. <laughs> um, but the men's team that, that, that we had was really good last year. You know, we were 10 and 3 at one point last season. Um, I think any elite level basketball is um, a level that you can take an appreciation from for the skill of the players on show. Um, I think that probably exacerbated my uh, the end of my time in local league was going back to local league on a Friday and looking at my own lack of ability compared to the players <laughs> that I was coaching at the weekend. Um, but yeah, any, any level that has got um, players that are exceptionally talented, you should be able to work at if you're a coach and you're, you're really interested in basketball. I think that's probably been my biggest learning from this season. Before we before we wrap up and I ask you some stock standard questions, uh, is there anything else that that you wanted to cover that we uh, that we haven't touched on yet? Um, I don't know. I don't think so. Um, not that comes to mind. Perfect. Then, uh, then I've got to ask you the question: What sure. is your condiment of the year? Of this year specifically. Of the last 12 months. Of the last 12 months. Um, my condiment of the year. <sighs> Let's go Should mayonnaise. Oh, he's got mayo. Yeah, Just standard. Real, Classic. Real renewed affection for mayonnaise this year. <laughs> Making a lot more sandwiches, working from home. <laughs> Uh, is it mayo on both sides or just one side? Like, what, what are we talking about? Just one side. Mayo, mayo is part of a balanced diet there. <laughs> oh, big sausage comes in with that. <laughs> with that condiment of the year. We've never had this before. Worcestershire sauce. <laughs> it's it's no Henderson's relish, big sausage, but uh, I respect the uh, respect, it. respect it. It's another good clue as to who big sausage is, though. <laughs> Nick Crane? Is it Nick? Did he? Nick, did I don't Nick know, it might be right now? He said that it might be Ryan Emery. I don't know. Oh, um, if you could play or coach anywhere in the world, where would it be? Uh, one game or as a career, or Let's say one game. Uh, <laughs> I suppose I should say Spectrum Center because I'm a Charlotte Hornets fan, but. You poor, poor thing. There are so, there are so many bad memories. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, I, I've been to um, a Betis Valencia game in Spain and oh, yeah. the atmosphere was absolutely insane. Um, and I think I would quite like to see what a Barcelona-Real Madrid game is like. Ooh. That would be a lot of fun. The game, The game I need to get over to see is um, Olympiakos, Panathinaikos, EuroLeague. Could you imagine? I have, I've I've watched some of those games on TV and uh, the atmosphere is just off the scale, isn't it? It's um, it's something else altogether. I've never, I've been around, um, had a, a few weeks traveling around Eastern Europe before and we kept trying to get into football games and we just, our schedule uh, didn't collide with any home games in the cities that we were around oh, for no. three weeks, which was remarkable. Uh, I think we caught an international break and then just everyone was away all the time. It was really frustrating. Um, so I really wanted to go to, to an Eastern European football game. But yeah, Eastern European basketball is uh, is a wild experience. I'd love to go to like a, uh, um, a Fenerbahce game or something as well. I, uh, I, play, I, I play, that's a very loose description of what I do. Basketball with a, obviously, Cambridge City Basketball Club fine institution check them out anyway uh and it's run by a bunch of greek lads and the passion that they have just playing the game and then talking about the game just times that by whatever it is in the gym and it's gonna be just absolutely electric yeah um, exactly so good good um where where is where is the best place you've you've coached or played then in your opinion uh, I'm going to leave played out of it altogether. Um, okay, that's fair. The best place I've coached would have to be... Um, possibly not for the uh, for the memories of the game itself, but we, we made the, um, the final of the um, 
Oh my god, I can't remember what the tournament's called. The Patrons Cup. That was close. Oh yes. We made the final of the Patrons Cup a couple of seasons ago. Um when I was assisting John with the men at uh, so it's the it's the tournament for NBL Division Two, um, the cup tournament for that league. Uh and we got to play it at um UEL Sports Doc. Um, oh yeah. And it's a, a really nice court, great facility and all that. Um but the best thing was that we had, you know, 250, 300 Ipswich fans behind us. And having um, been down there the previous season to support Nick and, and the girls winning the um, the Women's National Cup, it was just really special to be back there and, and be on the bench ourselves and, uh, you know, coaching in a, a sort of big occasion, if you like. It was uh, a lot of fun. Um, and for half the game, it was going really well as well. Um and then we got annihilated in the second half. But uh, it was a, a very positive memory for a very young team as well. Um, and, um, yeah, it's, it's one of the best things about our club is the, the travelling support we get. If you look at us in uh, the Under-18s Cup final last year um, at the uh, University of Essex Stadium, um, crowds that we take to junior final fours and things. Um, you know, if you're, if you're in a big event as an Ipswich basketball club team, you can guarantee that you'll get a following. Um, which which makes it all the more special. Well, if it's if it's you know possible with the uh, the current global situation, um, we we really want to get down to get focus hoops down to an Ipswich home game because it looks awesome. It always looks great. It sounds great, and uh, we need to we want to try and make that happen when the world resumes uh, some sort of normalcy. Uh, we've got another question in the chat from Big Sausage mm-hmm. saying. What is your favourite sausage, Rob? <laughs> Who is this? Who are you? Good on you. Uh, my favourite sausage. Um... <sighs> I don't know. Funnily enough, that's not one of the questions I've considered. Huh. Uh, he also says so Cumberland. Big, best cl- oh, strong, strong choice. Big Sausage also says best club in Britain. I'm assuming referring to Ipswich. Um, and fi- final one. Firstly, again, you have my commiserations for your Hornets uh, fandom. <laughs> but very quickly, why and will Ball be a hit? Have you got the jersey on order already? Why uh, NBA Live 2005 was my first PlayStation uh, basketball game. Um, I love making trades. I love building my own roster. And they had a ton of cap space because it was their first year as the Charlotte Bobcats. It was their first year. Oh, yeah, yeah. So they had a ton of cap space. You could sign free agent Alonzo Mourning and Carl Malone every season um, and make all the trades you wanted. And 14-year-old me was obsessed with doing that. Uh, so that's how it started. And then it's kind of waned every now and then. And every time uh, the association gets a bit weak, and I start thinking, why am I doing this? You know, at university, why am I staying up till 1 o'clock every morning just to watch us lose again in the seven <laughs> win season? Um Every time I've got to that point, there's been a player that's individually just just talented enough, whether it was Gerald Wallace the first time around, Al Jefferson, and then Gemba Walker, that's kind of kept me <laughs> kept me roped in. So um, that's why. Uh, Lamello, I, I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. The big question, I think, is whether LeVar can, can stay out of Jordan's way, because if he doesn't, mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't think Lamello will get given the opportunity because Jordan runs the team and if Lavar pisses him off too much then Melo's just gonna get traded. But uh um he's a talent he's a talented kid. He's a really t- I mean I remember seeing him seeing him over here at sixteen and yeah it was an exhibition against the Lions um and it had this weird atmosphere and it was him, it was Leangelo, Lavar Ball was coaching, Kevin Bristol played full the full forty minutes as well for Vitalis. But he's he's got something. He's got something. He didn't do a whole lot of defending that day, but no. the passes he can make are just dumb. They are crazy. His highlights from the NBL last year in Australia are mad. But mm. like you said, they are all offensive highlights. So we'll have to wait. Yes. It doesn't work in the NBA because it's all one on one. So if you're not going to play defense, then you're uh, you're in a hard place. So. Have you been able to get out and see a game? No, I've never seen an NBA game in the US. I've seen the only stuff I've seen in the US is is baseball. Um, I've seen a few uh, NBA games here. Um, I saw the first one 
uh, when Luol was with the uh, Bulls. And they came over and I think they played the Jazz and then was injured so he couldn't play. But we saw Duron Williams. Uh, I saw the Lakers Timberwolves whenever that was, maybe about five years ago. Um, and I've got an old friend from local league who's a massive Nuggets fan. Um, and we've been to watch one of the, I don't remember who they were playing, but the Nuggets were here one time. Oh, Pacers. Um, yes, yeah. I think so, yeah. And we went to watch that one. Faku Kampazzo has just joined the Nuggets. So then, officially, the most exciting team in the NBA. It's is that because of the Argentinian connection? It is a little bit. No, I just, I, I absolutely love his game. He's been one of my favourite players to watch in Europe for the past couple of seasons. Um, and it helps that he plays for the national team that I sort of keep half an eye on. I remember seeing him at either the last Olympics or the last... Oh, yeah. <laughs> I sort of forget uh, this has happened. <laughs> It's potentially massive, but we'll wait and see. Uh, well, my, my only big fear about Gordon Hayward is that he'll be brilliant for eight games and then injure himself again. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a big concern. Yeah, it's plagued him ever since the first time we tried to sign him because obviously before he went to Boston, he had accepted an offer from Charlotte, but Utah matched when he was a restricted free agent. Um, and then he ended up in Boston, ended up injured, um, and now he is, he's made it to Charlotte, so... We'll wait and see. If we get year five Golden Hayward back and, and see what could have been, then that will be spectacular to watch. But um, he's he's been through a lot. So I think he deserves a couple of injury-free seasons. Oh, I, I hope he smashes it. I hope he smashes it. And anybody who wants anything other than the best for that man, you 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 need to look at yourself in the mirror because the guy's the guy, nothing wrong. He's played his absolute heart out and he's been super unfortunate. So sacrificed go. a lot in, in, in Boston as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, one of these cases kind of like Ray Allen did when he went there, um, you know, they were a stacked team um, and he bought into playing a smaller role uh, when he was back, he bought into playing a smaller role. Um, so it'd be, it's, it's going to be exciting to get um, to see him watch a, t a leader team again. You know, that'd yeah. be, that'd be fun. I will say that. <laughs> well, <laughs> the, team, okay. the team, the team, the team is, the team is Lamar Bowles. Um, um, yeah, sorry, you were talking about the the mighty um, Faku Compazzo and seeing him play internationally. Yeah, I think I've seen him. Uh, I can't remember if it was the last Olympics or the last um, World Cup. Um, and frustratingly, I can't remember any of the names of the other players that they had playing, but they had a, a quite a young new team because obviously the Argentina team was largely the same for about, 12, 15 years, uh, Ginobili, Scola and Prigioni, but um, they had Campazzo, Campazzo uh, a point guard whose name I can't remember, and um, they were quite Marino. Him and Gabriel Deck work quite well together. Okay. Um, and is it is it Garino who's been on the Spurs books over the last couple of years? Um, yeah. Forward. I say yes. I want to say um, it was just it was a really fun team to watch. I mean, you know, a lot of a lot of Argentina teams have been really good to watch. So it's always nice to think to see international players um, break through in the NBA because they seem to to bring a little extra. I agree. A lot of people are like, "Oh, they've not played. He's not played at AAU." Rob, he hasn't played at AAU. He hasn't been on a coach driving around Texas. He has grown up in Argentina, played basketball in Argentina, and then played for. The best side to not play in Argentina. But has he played AOU? That's a really dumb knock to have on a player, and I'm not here for it. Um, Rob, a huge thank you for your time for joining us on uh, this Thursday. Oh, thanks um, very much for having me on this privilege. No worries. Um, yeah, we'll have to get you back on down the journey. Uh, you pop in as our roving Ipswich insider. You know, sounds, <laughs> sounds good. I'm going to update your card to say to, to mirror that. Um, but yeah, just a huge thank you. Absolute best of luck to you for the rest of the season. I look forward to seeing you personally when you come up to Cambridge. We'll uh, we'll be bringing the game obviously on the Focus Hoops uh, YouTube. Hopefully, we tried that this weekend. It was hit and miss. Um, but yes, looking forward to having you up and um, best of luck the rest of the way. Thanks very much, guys. And obviously, you, you mentioned coming down. We know that we'll we'll be uh, extending the invite as soon as we can for you guys to come and take in a game at Cobblestone as well. Really awesome. appreciate it. Thanks, Rob. Thank you. Right. Thanks a lot, guys. It's okay.
another wonderful interview. Oh, he's he's gone gone as well. He's not even <laughs> he's gone. no hanging around there. Just no, no. Out of here. See you later. Uh, huge thank you again to Rob Shatton for taking the time out to join us to talk about all things Ipswich basketball and all things Charlotte Bobcats um, and then Hornets. The poor poor man, I really feel for him. <laughs> We're going to take a quick word from Notch. Oh, I got a second Notch. Check it out. And uh, and we'll be right back. Word from our sponsors, Notch. The mark of achievement. And we are very glad to have them on board with Focus Hoops this year. They make fantastic bracelets that look super stylish and really help you celebrate your sporting achievement. They've just launched a basketball collection and we're really excited to be on board with them. Let's imagine that you're a player. Let's say that you're Courtney Vandersloot. You got 18 assists in a single ball game, and you want a notch and a bracelet to commemorate that fact. Well, you can do just that. Customize it to your team colors, put the year that you achieved it, and get it the exact size that you need. There are a number of the colors available. Or maybe you're a coach. Maybe you're the coach of a basketball team. Let's just say that you're the London Tyrannosaurus Rex. Your team wears red. You had the league's most valuable player, the MVP, and you want to celebrate that. You want to award them with a great looking notch bracelet. Well, you can do just that and you can get it saying MVP on the notch itself. That's the charm. You can get the color you want. Gold is one that I'd go for if we're commemorating the best player in the league. We could even get the team logo, if it's the Tyrannosaurus Rex, let's say, on there and present it in a beautiful presentation case. Huge thanks for Notch for coming aboard. Focus Hoops. And we're back. And we are back to talk uh, about the WNBL. A bit on the WBBL. We're going to go to Rincon, Kaz. And we're going to do all of that in about 20 minutes. Kaz, are you up for the, Kaz, are you up for the challenge? I am. I start the clock. Fantastic. Even though Robin Love mocked my pointing... It was a brutal one for Team of the Week, let me tell you. The group chat, Kaz, how long did we deliberate this decision for? Like Days, hours, four. more hours than there are in a day. <laughs> <laughs> this conversation went on and on and on, but here are the five that we ended up going with this week. Inmet Bautista, Player of the Week, in addition to being, of course, in the five of the week, finished with 21-6 points in the big win for them. Uh, huge victory on the road. Bounce back performance over Nottingham after losing the week before to Ipswich. It was uh, a gutsy performance from Inma and the whole of the Worcester team and a really important win. Of course, Harriet Wellham, 30 points, four rebounds, eight assists. Fantastic game, again, from Harriet Wellham. And it's just what she does. She and just that puts was, in these monster performances. Sorry, sorry, Darren. Um, and that was 10 of 12 from uh, two as well. She wins. So, so incredible efficiency from, from Wellham there. Uh, Katie Yanescusa. Um, I hope I've got the name correctly there. I've just realised I've never said it before. Um, 8.7 rebounds, five assists. You, you're thinking to yourself, those numbers don't, exactly jump out if i tell you that she missed one shot in the game she did that in 20 minutes and doing double duty playing for the wbbl team and was had i think the highest plus minus of plus 16 on her entire team bar maybe one player she was phenomenal she just did everything she needed to in a very small amount of time if she'd have been played longer those stats would have been even higher so and again, the eye test was really strong with KJ this week. So huge performance from her. And again, it's one of these where the numbers aren't leaping out at you, but when you delve a little deeper and you, you know, you watch tape, you just, and again, the conversations that we had, you understand why we couldn't not have her in Team Week this year. Gayla Comensana, or the Comensania, um, another fine performance with the win over Thames Valley. Again, did a little bit of everything, 16 and 10. So, you know, the numbers are there, but the overall performance was there as well. And finally, but last but not least, Amber Dean, 
Let me tell you about Amber Dean, the former Indiana Hoosier. That's right. Played Division One in college, and now she's playing Division One WNBL for Cardiff Met Archers. 30 points, five rebounds, five assists, four steals, 50% shooting from the floor, 27 efficiency. This was a loss for Cardiff, and it wasn't a particularly close loss either. But she came to play. She is going to be a problem this season. I'm really excited to get to see her. Can't wait for Cardiff to come down to Cambridge and I get to commentate Amber Dean playing against ARU because it is going to be excellent. I'm super excited. There's a reason she was D2 South uh, MVP last season because she can just turn it on. And this is the first game that they've played since March, maybe February. Yeah. And they're doing that. Come on now. It's just silly. I could not have her in there. Awesome, awesome performances. Uh, a couple of honourable mentions that we do have stats for, and I'll get to that in a moment. Maddie Bidette, 18-2-5. Really solid scoring performance for Nottingham Trent in their loss. Uh, Carolina Marquez, again, she's always there, thereabouts. She's so important for Worcester, 15-6-2. Christina Velke, really good against Anglia Ruskin. I think she had 17 points in the game uh, against... Who did they play? They played Ipswich. She had 23.6 Rebound, seven assists, 21 efficiency. Did a little bit of everything. A bus driver performance. Who who did you want to highlight, Kaz? Um, Faith Okwosa, um, who we had on a few weeks ago. Um, first, she, episode. first episode, yeah. Uh, she had um, nine points um, and 17 rebounds, nine of which were offensive rebounds uh, with an index of 23. And I just, just th those rebounds, just very impressive. <laughs> And the final honourable mention, or official honourable mention, this week was Esther Little. Uh, 10 points, 13 rebounds, uh, one assist, a 20 efficiency. Again, fantastic numbers. There are two players that I want to draw particular attention to, actually three from the Anglia Ruskin game. They play for Anglia Ruskin. Uh, firstly, Noah Sanchez Marquez, 17 points. No, she might have had 20. 20. 20 points. Don't have any of the stats because the stats, unfortunately, went working and I've not seen any get published after the fact. But she kept Anglia Ruskin in what was a really close, tight game that they were losing for the, for the longest period. A huge shout-out has to go to uh, Autumn Callis, who did a really good job of defending Velke, especially in the fourth quarter. I was re-watching the fourth quarter, and you can do the same over on our YouTube channel, Focus Hoops, on YouTube, which is possibly where you're watching this. So after this is done, just go and re-watch that final quarter because it was a really good quarter of basketball. It was the best quarter in that game, for sure. But um, In the last just, five minutes as well. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. But the way Callis, every single step of the way, she's on Velky. Mm -hmm. like, she doesn't let her breathe, and it really knocked her off her rhythm. So Callis didn't have the shooting performance that you expected to. And by the way, she might be the best shooter in the league. Might. It's like, wait to be seen, but the things you hear. But, um, yeah, she did a great defensive performance. But you, you have somebody you want to talk about. Jasmine July. Jasmine July. She was, so, as you said, we don't know her stats because um, they went out there. My guess was 17 points, eight rebounds. No idea how true that is, but that so was my guess. Definitely 17 points. 17 points. Um, she she was just she was just clutch when they needed her to be and she did so much in the game. So the um AIU came back on a fifteen to five run um in the last five minutes and they were able to to take the lead. They won by five in the yep. end. Um and there was a couple of a couple of threes um in the last minute and a half, two minutes. Um the AIU used that to take the lead. But Jasmine July was just she was just there when she needed to be um and she was just helping them get get over that line um also just a little bit more anglia ruskin centric news Catherine hulm back from injury which is fantastic to see one of the most important players in the league the last couple of years and uh oh yeah and chris kasha nanange out of retirement she's wearing so kutsaraki's old number the number four and uh yeah it's just nice to see kasha nanange playing basketball again she wasn't. She was just not happy with how the thing ended last year. So she's like, Do you know what? Yeah, they could. They need a bit of Naninge. So she is back 
to cause havoc in the paint. So very exciting times for going on at Anglia Ruskin and a really fantastic game. Now, a bit more news. The game this weekend against Thames Valley Cavaliers has been postponed, but I understand Anglia Ruskin will still be playing on Sunday uh, away to Nottingham Trent University. Uh, any more news that comes through, we'll let you know on our Facebook. No, we won't. We'll let you know on Twitter, probably. Maybe Instagram, maybe Facebook. Duh. Cass. First off, we need that compilation video. The most important compilation there is going out, but that's a side note. Definitely. Also, definitely. <laughs> also, um, shall we skip over to WBBL? Yes. So we, just had, so we just had two games this weekend, um, which was Seven Oaks and Nottingham and Leicester and Cardiff for the um, games to take them into the uh, cup finals. So I guess the, game, the better game of the two was the uh, Seven Oaks Nottingham. Um, Seven Oaks came out of that with a two point win, 69 67. Um, I believe it was Chelsea Shumpert that had a two in the last few seconds for Nottingham to. Tie the game, take the game to overtime, bounce down. Uh, it didn't happen. Um, so, uh, Seven Oaks through back to the final. Um, Renee Bush, again, had another amazing game. 23 points, four rebounds, an assist and a steal. Um, Janice Monacana and Kat Carr, you know, the, the three, those three players are such a core for Seven Oaks. And they're, um, you know, they're just there when you need them to be. Um Nottingham, Jasmine Joyner, 20 points, uh, 11 rebounds. Chelsea Shumpert, 23 and 5. Not quite as dominant as they were against Manchester the week before. Um, but the, not too much aside from those players uh, from Nottingham. And that was probably just what they were missing there to go up against Seven Oaks. Um, seven bunch bench points compared to the 20 from Seven Oaks. Um, so they go into the final against Leicester who beat Cardiff by 40 points, 67-27. Um, this was kind of done from the first quarter, really. Um, Cardiff was shooting 13% from the field. They shot 6 of 46. Um, no points from the bench, no points of turnovers, eight points in the paint. Um, they just couldn't really match up very well with Leicester at all. Um, Holly Winterburn... Two points, nine rebounds with nine assists. You know, she's not scoring. I think she had three shots the whole game. Um, but she's doing everything else that you needed to do. Um, Ella Clark, 15 points and 13 rebounds. And Cardiff just re didn't really have anyone that was, was going to match up with them there. Um, so we go into the final, Seven Oaks and Leicester in January. I don't know if we've got a date yet. Who have you got winning that one? Uh, it's usually about the 29th. Yes, yeah. Um, I use Seven Oaks, I think. I think it will be very close, and I think it will be a three-point game. It's very specific, isn't it? That's very specific. Who's going to get the game winner? Because those games always go down to the wire. They do, don't they? They do. Cat car. Oh, bold. Bold. Um, yeah, the, the Cardiff, like Cardiff had done well to get to that the point where they did, but that wasn't good. Yeah. 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 <laughs> they, they probably just want to put that behind them, get into the league, don't they? And that's right on with that. Um, it's not, unfortunately, up and running for this week, but you can see, scrolling along the bottom there, we have a Discord server. If you don't know what Discord is, it's um, it's it's kind of a new take on, on an old concept of forums, but we have loads of different rooms to you know hang out in, chat with. Uh, chat with us, chat with basketball fans uh, in general. Uh, it's a bit quiet over there now because it's only just launched. But if you're interested in that kind of thing, get involved. It's, um, also, we're, with the Below the Rim connections, they also have a Discord server. So why not join them as well and flip between the two for a bit of men's basketball action, a bit of women's. We've also got in the works, we were hoping to have it up for this week. It's not been uh, possible as yet. Uh, a fantasy league. We will be doing a fantasy league complete with draft. Um, we're aiming for that for next week to get it proper kicked off by. So you got an extra scouting week to, you know, who do you like? What players are jumping out at you from the WBBL? Uh, big shout out to, you know, one of the one of the key people here at Focus Hoops, uh, Greg Mpofu, for his hard work there. 
Check it out. You're going to love it. Kaz. If you do sign up, use an email address that exists that's yours as well. <laughs> just, a, just a little bit of advice for people. Yeah, so as Kaz joined up to the Discord, yeah, no, just made up an email <laughs> address. So, yeah, that is, that is actually a genuinely good tip. Um, Kazzy B, let us go to Rincon Kaz. We still don't have a jingle for that. I'm going to fix that. I promise you, you. I think you just need to sing it. I, this is not the Car Throttle podcast. Okay. I'm not Alex. What's his chops? Continue. Um, so quite a lot going on uh, around the world this week. Um, we've had, or last week, sorry. Um, so EuroLeague kicked off last week, the, the group games. So for people that maybe aren't as familiar with it, um, the European uh, <laughs> the European um teams generally play domestic games in the domestic league and then they have two competitions the euro cup and the euro league euro league is the higher of the two um and euro cup the second tier um teams are in groups they play a series of group games and then they go off into um like playoff playoffs and march madness type um seeding like that um so EuroLeague kicked off um, and we had some big performances um, from some players that we've, you know, grown to know and love. So Fenerbahce featuring Satu Sabali, Kayla McBride, Jasmine Thomas, Keir Stokes and Keir Vaughan. So they are currently 11-0 and 0 in the Turkish League and they lost their first game in the, um, well, wow. at all. They lost, they lost to um, Leon, I think, yes. Yes, sorry. Uh, is, that is that the artist also known as Asvel? Yes. Yes, it is. Yeah, with Alicia Clark and Marianne Johannes. Oh, yes. Again. Had a game. On, she had a game. I don't know if it's on the Discord. And again, plug for the Discord. But there has definitely been chat about how that woman is just a problem. So, a big problem. Against um, USK Praha, which is Alyssa Thomas's team, where she's still playing without any shoulders. I'm still playing 40 minutes a game. Um, th so Leon lost to USK um, by two points. Maria Johannes, 38 points, and six of them were three pointers. Um, sorry, they lost by a point, which is after a performance like that, you want to see them come out with the win. Um, but it will be interesting as well to see her back with New York maybe next season. If she is, I'm not sure of her contract status, but she was with New York last season. Um, so it'll be interesting how she can fit into that because that, if she does go back with New York, that's going to be a player that they need and they want. Um, yeah, so Fenerbahce lost their first game, but they won their other two. And Satu Sabali was put into the sort of, they have a player of the day award she was in that twice for two days she had 30 points 11 rebounds in the first game as a debut so Sassy Savile's debut in Euro League 30 points and in game two she had 23 points eight rebounds and five assists um UMMC Katrinberg obviously had no problem with anything any games well, I mean, they were doing. why would they no you know not 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 I don't want to say not even a bit of a challenge really and Emma Mieseman wasn't playing, so they're only going to get better. Um, but as an average of their three games, Brianna Stewart, 15 points. Ali Quigley, 14 points. Courtney Vandersloot, 10 points. John Cole Jones, 20 points a game. Maria Vadevere, 14 points. What? They are, they're unstoppable. I'm going to say they're unstoppable. You cannot stop that team. Um, and I'll be proven wrong. Let's see. They have, they've been cursed. This is Kaz curses. It's... <laughs> Kaz's curse from Kaz's corner. Uh, Kaz, shall we do our thing of Shankly showing group tables and stuff? Yes, let's. Yes, let's do that. Let's do that. Boom! There they are, Shankly. <laughs> so um, the next the next round is in January. That's when we, we there's two more games next week. It's just Galatasaray and Sopron um, catching up on two of their games, and then the rest of the group games following January. Um, so obviously we've got now interest that we have personally, or at least with British basketball interest, I suppose as well. 
Uh, we're looking at Perfumerias Avenida. Um, obviously, top of their group, they've got the Samuelson sisters. Uh, who else have you kept a, a close eye on? For me, I'll be perfectly honest, I think I watched every game of Group C and dipped in for other stuff, even though the Satunicorn is in Group B. Um, but did did anybody catch your eye? Are there any teams that you're really focused on? So I've been uh, watching just the Catherine Berg just because even though, you know, I've said it's not competitive, it's just really fun to see the players that they have together. Um, and also um, Dynamo Kursk because um, Amanda Zoe B and uh, Arike Ogubuwale are playing um, for them. And surprisingly, actually, they've gone 0-2. Um, they're top of the Russian League. Uh, sorry, this well, joint top. They haven't yet played um, at Katrinburg. Um so that that was their first losses as well, um, and I've been enjoying watching them them play. Um, Spa Girona as well. Um, Chelsea Gray plays for them, um, and that's been obviously apart from the Katrinburg game, they've been some good games there. Now, if you just cast your attention to over in Group C, you will see that TTT Riga zero three record, but they have three points. Beretta Family Skio one and two record they have four points so if Riga beat if Riga get a win and Beretta Familia Schio lose their next game they will be tied on five points each because teams are being awarded points even in cases of losses which is strikes me as a very Argentine way of doing things but there we are it seems it's an interesting way of doing things isn't it it's a, it, it is yeah. it is it's, that's 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 definitely the word for it. Um, but yeah, any any more for any more with here, Rincon Cas? Um, Fenerbahce, like they they're so good. Satu is so good. Well, she's it? the Sat- she's the Satu Nicole. Yeah. She is. <laughs> um, I think that needs to be a graphic somehow. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Next week's a bit a bit less wild, so maybe maybe. Um, so that is going to do it for the Kaz and Dash. No, is there any any quickly dip into a land down under? Yes. Um, yes, yes, yes. So as we mentioned just a bit earlier, we were speaking to Brit Smart, UC Capitals sitting top of the table. Everything was great. They'd lost one game. They've now lost two games in addition to that one. Um, yes. Yeah, I agree. Um, and <clears throat> so... so so Southside have now overtaken them and the final game final game of the regular season um is Sunday our time between um sorry it's not the final game it's the final day of games between Southside and UC Capitals which will be the um sort of position decider so the top two teams will either be Southside or um UC Capitals and it'll come down to that game so that'll be that's one to watch um, and then we get into the playoffs and to the finals um so that's going to be a great one. Liz Cambage has obviously been playing Liz Cambage like out of, uh, out of her skin. Yeah, thirty-five Which... points, seven rebounds. <laughs> She's been averaging what twenty-four points a game. Yeah, something like that. Twenty-four, yeah. twenty-seven. And had she not fouled, like got into foul trouble earlier, and been playing longer, because I don't know what her minutes are, but there's been a lot of games where she's not played that many minutes. Um, she'd be averaging like thirty. I mean, bear in mind she's not played for the best better part of a year. Exactly. Yeah. Point. So yeah. I, the WNBA needs to be worried for when she's when she's back. Can Can I give you my stat line? St- oh, oh, yes. Give us the stat line of the week. Is it one or three? Do I get to choose? I've got, you, I've got three, and you can pick. So, so Han Zhu in China, New York okay. Liberty player, um, thirty six points, fourteen rebounds, in a win. Sorry, how many points? Thirty six. 36 and 14. 14 yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. Benaja Laney, playing in Israel, um, has had, this is over two games, 56 points, um, 11 rebounds, and has gone 18 for 18 from the free throw line. She's had nine free throws in each game, made them both 56 points across the two games. Yeah, okay. Okay, okay, okay. And this one doesn't really fit, but I, I found it and I liked it. So... <laughs> Liz Campage plays for the the Southside Flyers. In the she last two does. in the last two games, teams have fouled the Southside Flyers thirty five times. Twenty one of those fouls have been on Liz Campage. 
she gets fouled 60% of the time <laughs> when a foul is called against sorry on, on her so she's going to the line yeah 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 so oh. she's taking she's taking a run i just wanted to throw that out there because that's that's a lot <laughs> i do i mean i do love i do i do love a how many times does a player get fouled does yeah. it, it is it is yeah. genuinely and coaches out there might be like what is wrong with you but that is honest to goodness one of the first things i look for in a stat sheet it's like points Assists, turnovers, how many times did they get fouled? Ooh. Uh, <sighs> come on. Yeah. Are you going to be anybody else? <laughs> I mean, really. But Naja Laney, just, do you know what? I'm, I'm, hey, most of the time, I'm an impartial man. I have no biases in this world, not really. But I do have one, and it's Bet Naja Laney. If it was, come on now. So you set, her, you set us all up there. Go on. Her team, uh, Ramallah, playing uh, in Israel. They are in the Euro Cup, so the second tier um, league. Uh, she's also playing with Tiffany Mitchell, and her and Tiffany Mitchell are just scoring like sixty points a game between them. Um, they're two and zero at the moment, but they're in Group B, um, and Group B in the Euro Cup is a good one to watch. It's got OGM Orman Spore with uh, Rakana Williams and oh, Brittany yeah, Sykes yeah. from the Sparks playing. There are it's a three team group. I think the other one's a Swedish team. Um, but I think that's going to be a fun group to watch. Oh, and for our Swedish update, we've got just a man for that. All right, Kaz, any more for any more tonight? One more. Jordan Canada has just signed with Hatay in Turkey. Oh, there we go. And again, so, they're in Euro Cup as well. So There we are. There we go. Uh, there is WNBA news happening. Uh, we'll have a bigger roundup of WNBA news um, next Thursday. Next Thursday. And we'll also have a real good deep dive into WBBL. That is our promise to you. Uh, we've got a bunch of good stuff coming up this week. Uh, it looks like we've got another interview coming. And of course, if you're sat there a bit of a loss, you're like, I need more Kaz and Daz. Well, firstly, thank you. That's very kind. Uh, we've got loads of interviews on our YouTube channel and also some go up as audio podcasts on Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts, really. So do check us out on YouTube and across the platforms really does help us out. Give us a follow on the social medias as well. Um, Kaz, where can people find you if they want to just get, you know, go to the source of Kaz Corner? Right to the source. You can go to Hoopin Kazzy V with two Zs on Twitter. <laughs> and I don't know what means. <laughs> just go I'm on the so Facebook Instagram, it'll be there, thereabouts. <laughs> There'll be a story posted. It'll have Kaz's details. Uh, follow me on Instagram. Don't follow me on Instagram. Follow me on Twitter at Awaits Touch, A U E D S T O U C H. And of course, follow us at Focus Hoops. Huge How do you remember always. those just like that? How does that just pop into your head when someone's like, what is your. Because <laughs> I've, I've been doing this for the six years with, with Awaits Touch. Uh, also, don't forget, Notch. Yeah. Uh, check them out. They do an amazing job. Do you want to get the perfect gift for Christmas for the sports person in your life? Get them a notch. Did they do really good in the basketball game? Check out the Notch basketball collection. Check it out. They're really good stuff. I I don't wear... Oh, God, right. Very quick plug. I don't wear bracelets. I don't wear jewellery. However, I seen, a what, I seen this notch thing. I was like, that looks great. Went and bought it. They've been amazing to, to partner with. And now I wear this literally every single day. Like, I am not without this bracelet. And it really motivates me to get out there and get running. So it's really good. I really enjoy it. Okay, that's all for us. Thank you, as always. Thank you. Big shout out. Thank you to Rob from Ipswich for joining us. Rob Shatton for coming in and letting us, you know, peek behind the curtain of all things Ipswich basketball. Thanks as ever for you, Kaz. And thank you, as always, to everybody who's got involved in the comments and liked and watched and hopefully enjoyed what we are about. We will talk to you next week. Thank you. and. Uh, have a good one. Join the Discord.